those who are tuning in to the District 8 Town Hall meeting. Um, this format is a little different, but we have some pretty cool guests and there's several of the neighborhood presidents of District 8. Well, it was Ms. Maureen Coleman of Tuxedo. In addition to that, we have Ms. Vicki Moore of Central Park. We have George McCall of Inslee. We have Mr. Littleton of Green Acres, and we have Mr. Gunn of Bellevue Heights. Um, I'm very happy you all that you all can be with us this evening. I want you to know I did speak to your other presidents. Some of them either have prior commitments in, for to be in person and or uh, for health reasons could not be with us. But I know several are tuned in, so I'm happy you all are able to be with us. So the residents of District 8, thanks for being here as well. Um, as far as being online and interacting with us, our format is pretty simple. I'll give you an update. Um, I'll try to go through it as fast as possible on some things we've been able to accomplish in 2020 in the middle of coronavirus, and then we'll spend the majority of our time answering questions. I'd like to remind people I don't have the answer or don't know the answer to everything. So I have many team members who are present today to help assist with that. Um, on video, it includes Chris Hatcher of the Community Development Department, uh, Ms. Danita Ryan, Public Works, who's in person, Josh Yates of Public Works in person, um, Deputy Chief Davin um, Davenport by video, uh, Deputy Chief Ron Sellers by video, and, and Captain Doyle is in person here at West Precinct, as well as Mr. James Fowler of Transportation in person, Mike Moore of the Crossplex, because I know that is a crown and jewel, District 8, and Mr. Cornell Wesley and Coriate Hauser both have economic development and they're both here in person as well as Darren Witt via video. With that, we'll jump right in and start giving some updates and highlights. Um, I always like to remind people that in addition to Councilor Hoyt's office, uh, his staff, as well as my office, full-time you all have community resource representatives and you all actually have three that represent District 8. That's Jasmine Fells, Herman Lumsey, as well as Andre Watson. Their information is actually listed here, their office number and cell number, as well as their email address. And I encourage you, um, in addition to reaching out to the mayor's office, in addition to reaching out to the counselor's office, um, as ne not only neighborhood officers, but as residents of District 8, if you have an issue, if you have a question, if you have a concern, if you have a thought, Please always feel free to engage Ms. Fells, Mr. Lumsey, and Mr. Watson, and all of their information is right here for you. I think it's important to give a COVID update and vaccination update, that is. Um, we really want to encourage the residents of District 8 to get vaccinated. Um, getting vaccinated does two things. Um, one, it gets us back quicker to our way of life, including not being able to wear these masks. Um, but something more importantly, it saves lives. And so I really want to encourage the neighborhood officers and leaders. You all have a voice. You all have a platform. People trust you. People listen to you. Um, please encourage your your residents uh, to get vaccinated. The information is here. They have options. Um, they have an online option to visit uabmedicinevaccine.org to register online, or they can call. Um, 205-975-1881. Again, that's 205-975-1881 to register for your COVID vaccine. You can also register with the Jefferson County COVID hotline at 205-858-2221. Again, that's 205-858-2221. I do feel we're in this fourth quarter of the coronavirus, but the game is not over. I uh, feel we're winning, um, but we must stay um, hard at it. That includes wearing our mask, which is why the city continued. We didn't do that in isolation as elected officials. We did that in consultation with the leaders of Jefferson County Health Department, as well as the leadership um, at the UAB School of Medicine and the UAB Health Systems. It's important that we do this because enough people have not been vaccinated. It's important we do this because people are still catching the coronavirus. People are still being admitted to the hospital. And unfortunately, some people are still dying. And so I want you all to remain vocal leaders in helping us fight this. So I'm grateful to you all. 
Now jumping in right into some meat of things that I think are important to residents of District 8. Um, each district is not created equally. I would say District 8 has its share of considerable blight. What we've tried to do over the last three years is not only remove it, but track it, track it daily, track it weekly, monthly, and yearly. And so the numbers you see before you all is um, on a yearly basis what we've done as far as removing blight in District 8. There's a lot more to be done, but as you can see, we try to be measured, spread out across all nine districts of blight removal. And so when you add this number up and you do it over the number of years, it comes to well over, I want to say, 1,200 for the entire city that we removed since we've been in office. Um, and just in the first quarter, we have had eight, but I know if I ask each of you all right now, you could give me an address. You can give me a block. You can give me a street. So there's a lot more work to do, and we'll continue to do it. In addition to blight removal, I think it's important. I know all of you all are walkers of your neighborhood. I know each of you all receive calls. Um, I know people reach out to you and tell you things they see uh, when they walk by somewhere, alley, a street, um, and you see things in a person's front lawn. You see it on their porch. You may see it in the back alley. Well, the city of Birmingham actually has housing code um, ordinance, and a lot of things can be in violation, such as systems. Um, other maintenance codes violation, damaged windows or doors, chipped exterior paint, and all other type of things. And so when you look at this form right here, um, and you all can see it right here too if you don't want to look down. When you look at this form right here, you see that over the course of years, the amount of inspections, literally this is just in District 8. Um, and you see the high number already. Uh, for the first quarter of 2021, so we will continue to be aggressive in making sure citizens are in compliance um, or compliant with their housing code, as well as if there's anything the city can do to assist. We acknowledge a lot of our our citizens are seniors, senior citizens. We acknowledge some are elder. We acknowledge some of the um, economic issues, et cetera, but we're always here to help but we do want people to know certain codes exist and want people to not be in violation. Now, um, it's pretty standard. Um, I know people have complained about 311 for quite some time, but we've continued to upgrade it and upgrade it. And so we want people to know when there are issues of junk, auto parts, furniture, household appliances, trash tires, tree trimmings, debris, and all other things you think or know that don't belong, we encourage you to call 311 in addition to those three representatives we spoke about earlier. One of the biggest common code violations is illegally parked vehicles. Residential, residential parking is permitted for operational passenger cars, as we know, but they're not permitted in your yard. We did a sweep, uh, I want to say a few weeks back, um, and it was in various parts of the city. What I can tell y'all is this, uh, if we don't do something about the violations, people complain. When we go out there and ticket, and then three days later pull up with the, um, the truck to tow it away, people complain. Either way, it's one of those situations where people complain, but we wanna encourage people um, to know the rules. And one of the rules is your car can't be parked on the lawn especially if it just sits there, doesn't move, tires are flat. Um, it's, it's fully yellow now because of the entire month of March. Um, the pollen was not kind to us, stuff like that. So we wanna have you as leaders encourage your neighbors, you know, just pick up the phone and say, hey, if this car is important to you and you don't want it towed, you don't want it ticketed, we encourage you to get it off the lawn. We have some other ordinances outside of housing codes um, that include zoning enforcement. Um, and some of the breaches include um, using your private residential property for business. Y'all know what I'm talking about, shade tree mechanics. Um, outside storage that you don't necessarily have a permit for, uh, home occupation violations, uh, fence violations, and the one you hate the most, an inoperable vehicle. So when you look at this number, 
I, I imagine in 18, we weren't necessarily tracking, but we started tracking in 19. And as you see, um, these are active zoning cases. Um, a lot have been closed out, but these are active. Moving on to another touchy subject that people complain to you all about, and then there's a ripple, you complain to us, um, and that is cutting grass, weed abatement. This is something we have been tracking for quite some time. Y'all should know, unfortunately, the city of Birmingham has an overwhelming amount of empty lots. Um, y'all know I'm truthful with y'all. Um, I've always stated this, Mr. McCall, you know I've said this, the city of Birmingham, it's not realistic or sustainable to be in the grass cutting business, right? That in this space, that in the area of empty lots is too many citywide. And Ms. Ryan will tell you, we cut one, um, and then it grows back that fast, but we can't get back to it that fast because we're on in another whole block or a whole nother street or a whole nother neighborhood or a whole nother district cutting. And we only have so much manpower on our city side, and we only have so much resources financially on the contractual side for external um, third party people to help us cut. What we're doing in 21 is different. I want y'all to know this is a little bit more coordination between um, our internal team that works for the Department of Public Works as well as the contractors. And so and at a minimum, it doesn't look like spot work, right? You hit a block, you have at least four empty lots, you see two cut and two not cut. That looks crazy. Why is that way? So more communication and coordination internally with our team, as well as the third party people. We think that's important. But you see the numbers we do cut. And we wanted you all to know that. Now. This is where I can be playing with y'all because I know you get pissed about it too. I've seen it with my own eyes in each of your neighborhoods. Um, I always like to start with you, Mr. Gunn, in the Bellevue Heights Avenue I exit for the life of me. Um, I'm going to be very plain. I hope this doesn't offend anybody. But whatever your economic status is, I'm not sure who taught you when you get to the exit to let down your window and throw out whatever's in your car. Truthfully, I'll never understand that. I also don't understand people who have trash. They take it from their house and put it somewhere else. I don't understand that neither. And I know y'all don't want Big Brother on the cor on every corner in the form of a camera. I know y'all don't want a police officer on every corner. I know you all don't necessarily have a neighborhood block watch captain in every block in your neighborhoods to help you be additional eyes and ears to catch this type of work. But we do want you to know. We pick it up, they put it back down. We want you to know we got uh, teams out there who literally participate in and do litter crews, y'all. They're just litter crews only. They don't do nothing else, especially on Saturdays and other days of the week. Um, if you are following us on some of our social media channels, we've actually started sharing the amount of litter we actually pick up. We show before and after pictures, et cetera, but it's our own people. And when I say our own people, I'm talking about our own neighbors. I'm talking about they, they have a trail to a convenience store from their home. They walk to the convenience store, they make a purchase. A bag of chips, drink, and if they finish that bag of chips and drinks before they get back to their home, they just drop it on the ground. And so one of the things we wanna do, I talked to Dr. Mark Sullivan. Uh, the truth is we may can't, change our adult behavior because it's too ingrained. The way we deal with our trash, the way we view things. But if we can teach the younger generation around the importance of recycling, um, the importance of putting your trash away in this area, not dumping, not littering, and at a minimum, maybe it's different for the next generation. But that's something we, we need to partner with the school system for because sometimes I don't understand the nasty adult behavior, but it does exist. Unfortunately, it exists in your district at a level that kind of pains me, but you've lived there. How many of the years you've lived in Inslee, sir? 77. 77. Man, stop playing. <laughs> oh, hell. How long you lived in Tuxedo? Um, about 
something. Thirteen. What about you, Bellevue? Green Acres. How many years you lived in Green Acres? And how long y'all been seeing this type of stuff? <laughs> We will continue to pick it up. We want to encourage you to continue to call this number, call 311, call 2254-6344 if you see it. We'll get at it. Uh, we continue to get at it, but we want you to know the city is doing its part. But the real, real truth, we need our citizens to do their part too. I know that was long, but I wanted to go through it. All right, at this table, how many people are Inslee High School graduates? Anybody? Nobody. All right, this was a historic school that people should know black people can go to for a very long time. They had to go to Western Owen. Who went to who went to jail? All right, boom. Jail in the house. Here's what happened. Um, at some point, I don't know y'all if it was the 60s, 70s, or 80s, but we had all these schools. School system owned some, city of Birmingham owned some. In 2021, that still exists especially for the, some of the empty buildings. School system owns some, city of Birmingham owns some. In the case of Inslee High School, city of Birmingham owns that school, not the school system. Um, and that was actually a situation where they did own it. We made the purchase because we wanted to do mixed use development on it, mainly residential. There are people on my team here that can go into detail of that later. Mr. Wesley's here if you want. But we want you to know that there's some movement at this school um, for a development project. Um, and so at some point, we know this site will be cleared and maybe we can go into detail later, but I just wanted to bring that up. I know it's an eyesore, um, no different than Caraway, no different than a lot of sites were, but we're getting movement in these mega sites um, as, as it relates to revitalization. You see here on page 12, some of the projected things, again, he can go into detail, but as stated, it's mixed use. Thing I'm excited about is more opportunities for healthy food, so a possible grocery store on the site. Um, but we think it complements the area to have this mixed use development in this area. Y'all should know, Mr. McCall used to want to beat me up because I, 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 because I got it wrong. <laughs> I got it wrong with um, Bush, Faithy Way. And I acknowledge I wasn't sensitive enough, Mr. President. But since then, I've learned a lot. I've listened more. I shut up. <laughs> and this is going to be some good development for this area. So happy about that. Um, Oak Hill development. You talked to me about this, right? I told you I was going to get you an answer. So. Um, maybe somebody on the team can go into more detail, but on page 13, I did want to provide some continuation of the project overview. The price range of these homes will be somewhere between 169 and 200,000. And the whole idea of infill, um, infill housing with 26 new construction, Mr. Um, President, I'm speaking to you, Mr. Dunn. Um, if you go to 14, it gives you a little bit more detail on inside. I think most of these homes would be somewhere between 1,100 and 1,900 square feet with three beds, two and a half baths. Now, I'm going to come back to you, Mr. McCall, because we got McCormick right in my, in my opinion. We took a long time. Um, this has been an existing building for 30, I don't know, well more than 30 years, but it's been empty 30 years, 30 plus years. And the reason why the, we're not, there's a difference between demolishing this building and deconstructing it. We chose a deconstruction model, which is why it's taking so long, because we want to keep uh, actual, we want to keep a lot of what exists there and, and use it as part of a rebuild. And to go from 10 floors to, I believe, what is it? Um, is it five stories? Um, but it'd be close in height to the 10 story original building, if that makes any sense. So tell me, uh, final stage of demolition will be Monday, April 12th. Um, at a certain point, 
we all know when you're driving on 2059 or you're in Inslee at a certain point, you can see this building, right? It's a beacon. But in a few weeks, you won't see it. But probably within the year, you will see another building there um, that is beautiful, that will be, we believe, a catalyst for more foot traffic, as well as supporting the existing small business owners in that area. So we're excited about that. Um, on the next page, again, it's just, Mr. McCall, you, you know this, this Saturday. So tell everybody there's another community engagement meeting. We'll continue to have community engagement meetings for people to get updates, more detail on the building and the surrounding area as well. We're very appreciative, by the way, of the existing small business owners in the area, um, from Mr. Darrell Williams um, to Mr. Callens, um, as well as um, Mr. Sperling. I know he's been on the other side of us for a while, but we support anybody that's cast down their bucket and made the necessary investments in his league, and all three of those gentlemen and others have done that. So we're very grateful. And we believe when this building changes, um, it's like a lot of areas, um, you always got some building that's a foundation and everything around it can start growing as well. We believe that's the case with this. Now, we're getting to a sensitive topic. We're gonna talk about BPD. First thing I wanna do is say, Captain Doyle, I'm looking at you. We're grateful to you. Um, I hope these officers, these neighborhood presidents, I have five here, but I hope the other five who could not make it tonight. I hope all 10 of you all got Captain Doyle on speed dial. You can get to her. You can't get to her, you can get to her lieutenants. You can't get to her lieutenants, you can get to her sergeants. Um, but every officer I speak to, and a lot of citizens I speak to really appreciate your leadership and I want to say publicly in front of these neighborhood officers, thank you. Um, and I want you all to know that BPD participates uh, in community engagement. Everything is not about enforcement. Everything is not about arresting. So when you look at um, Ms., um, Ms. Felicia here, she is actually a civilian. Do I have that correct? She is not a sworn officer. And so let's say you got issues in tuxedo and you need more residential buy-in to be additional eyes and ears. Well, she can help you start a neighborhood watch program. She can help you do block captains for each block and train them and teach them. I want to engage in ride alongs and green acres and things like that. So I really want you all to not only consider Captain Dole as an asset to you, but the civilian side of this, when y'all want and need. See, let me tell you what y'all good at, because I see it. Y'all have these neighborhood cleanup days, each of you. And y'all have residents come out on a Saturday and everybody participates. They got their pickup stick, got their bags, have their gloves, and y'all get at it. I really want to encourage y'all to do the same thing on the, on the, I guess, the community policing side and start building neighborhood watch programs and block watch happens because here's what I believe this can benefit to you. You get these additional eyes and ears, all of a sudden when, you, when somebody's illegally dumping, you can get somebody to get a car tag. You can get somebody to take their cell phone, take their device, whatever they have record it, get that information to us so we can get some charges on that person. You get those additional eyes and ears as block captains. Even if there are no cameras in the area, but certain shots are fired again, you can get somebody to get that license plate numbers and say they drove off here and there. You want the additional eyes and ears. They're not the police. You don't want your residents to be police. But you want them to go from just calling 911 to saying this is my block I feel empowered. I'm going to assist in making sure this block is safe. She can help y'all do that. And if you're not doing that, I really want to encourage you to start doing that. Now, the next page, page 18, speaks to um, an email address as well as an app. Now, I know, know y'all got some smartphones and tablets around this table. 
So if you as a neighborhood officer don't have the BPD app, I really want to encourage you to get it, then share it with your neighbors, whether it's on your next door, your Facebook page, your email list, your text list, whatever it is. This again gives you an additional tool when you see something, you can say something, you can submit it. It's kind of different from actually picking up the phone, calling 911, but Captain to tell you, we believe it's helpful. So hope y'all can take advantage of that. Now, show of hands, and we got people watching, but show of hands, how many of you all believe that you got at least one dope house, trap house, or drug house in your neighborhood? <laughs> all right. So you look here on page 19. We have created a drug nuisance abatement team. When I say we, I can't take credit. I give the credit to Ms. Nicole King, who was the city attorney, who was a lawyer for a long time and prosecutor. And there were some laws that already existed around nuisance abatement. And the whole idea is you all get frustrated because you call 911. They shut the operation down. Police can't solve nothing. You don't see nobody come out the house, kicked out of the house, or the house boarded up. The traffic get back jumping. Transactions get back jumping. Y'all pissed again. You call us again. We go out. Happens again. Well, in a situation like this, this drug nuisance abatement team, as you see the detail here, it's a whole different ball game from an investigation standpoint, from a being able to get a judge involved standpoint. And if we can find tangible information submitted to that judge, then you can get an eviction at that place and you can shut that whole house down and you can trust that it's working. And it's only been in existence like one year, but I'm telling you it's working. So I know this number by heart because I used to work up there, 254-2369 is the legal department. If you feel you got a drug house that's a nuisance, call that number, report that. You got that number access to you five days a week, 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. Critical repair program, the numbers go, the numbers definitely went down in 2020 due to the coronavirus. But as stated earlier, when some residents have code violations, we also want you to know a program exists through the community um, development departments with CDBZ funds. It's competitive. Just because you apply doesn't mean your citizen, your resident will get it. A lot of it is income based. And then there are a long, long list of people that apply for it. So we get a lot of calls, people upset that says, hey, my grandmother applied, mother applied, I applied. Why do I keep getting denied, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but we want you to know for this year, we begin accepting applications uh, pretty much the end of the third quarter this year, September. So just an FYI. Besides the ones that's already been in it? Yeah, and I, I, I think I can get a team member to explain. I'm going to assume that the whole process starts over. I don't know if there's a, a waiting list. I think you have to restart for each application window. I'll let one of my team members verify because I don't want, never want to misspeak to something important like this. 21, pothole repairs. It speaks for itself. Um, we want to keep your front end alignment tight. We don't want y'all cursing us out. So there you go. Street resurfacing, kind of same thing. Um, it's pretty much spread out throughout the nine districts. Unfortunately, we can't say in one year we can pave every street in District 8 because what we've done is commit 10 million a year and that 10 million is spread out over nine districts. But as you can see, what we've done um, your number is actually increasing in 21 compared to what we did in 2020, which will allow us to pay more streets in District 8. But total combined, you see that we're paving every year. And when you go to 23, for the sake of the audience, um, there are a lot of streets that have been paved over the last three years. We will find a way to get you this information in one of my hats, but I'll, you will get these streets and so people can know that We've been paving in District 8. When you go to page 24, we talk about streets to be resurfaced not only in 2021, but literally over the next two years. And so these streets are already in the queue over for a five-year street paving plan in District 8. And so 
No, we couldn't get to every street in one year, but through this five year plan, you see, we just got to put the money towards it and allocate that. I am happy to tell you, we will be putting another $10 million in street resurfacing citywide for the upcoming budget that we'll submit to the council in May. I didn't even see this. On page 25 is more streets. So, again, it's a lot of more streets to be paved over this five year pay street paving plan. And I know a lot of you all got concerns about some streets. You should see some of each of you also see something from your neighborhood in here. No different than sidewalks for the upcoming year. We're going to invest about 180 K 180,000 in sidewalk repair and boom, Abracadabra, that's it. Uh, my job is to shut up now, I believe, and turn it over to Ms. Silbel, who's going to quarterback our Q&A. And this is the point where, again, I have team members here that can give you way more of a cool answer than I probably could. All right. Yes, sir. Thank you so much, Mayor, and thank you to everyone who is joining us this evening. A special thank you to neighbors in Bellevue Heights, Bush Hills, Central Park, Inslee, Inslee Highlands, Fairview, Green Acres, Rising West Princeton, Thomas, and Tuxedo for all that you do. So the first question tonight, Mayor, is a really, really interesting one. And, and, and from the heart, basically, the question is, how can we improve the quality of life in District 8? So I guess I can answer this question. I think one of the things you do is you, I start with infrastructure. I think it's extremely important that at a minimum you do the blocking and tackling for a neighborhood. What is that? You pave streets. You make sidewalks walkable. You tear down blighted. You tear down blight. You um, you invest in those neighborhood parks in District Eight, right? You partner with Alabama Power and, and put more lights up in that area. So you do those things from an infrastructure standpoint. That's not necessarily about people, right? That's that's about place. On the people side of quality of life, again, we partner with Captain Dole, Dole and you partner with that um, Miss Felicia, and you get these block captains going, and we train them to be additional eyes for you all as presidents to say what's going on in this block. One person in the block telling you, you organize that, you will see crime go down because the, the law-abiding citizens should be in control and feel empowered, not the handful of people that are committing crime. The majority of citizens in Green Acres and Bellevue Heights and Central Park and Inslee and Tuxedo do their part and are law-abiding citizens. You all should be, you all should feel good about running away the people, the small amount of people that are doing bad. You are in control. You have more power. You have more numbers. You should exercise that. But in addition to that, you know, quality of life, for me, what does that look like? I got to get a grocery store to District 8. It's something we've been working on for three years. You all should know that I've been, we've been told no more than yes, several different, grat, um, several different grocery stores. And the truth is, we'll continue to let people tell us no until we get to a yes. The point is, we'll keep asking and engaging and brokering and negotiating to get a grocery store because I believe healthy food hits directly at quality of life. And then the other thing is not enough to just tear down houses here. I think infill housing, y'all don't want us to just keep cutting grass and eight. You want us to build up homes, single fam more single family homes. In District 8, the more homes we build, the more families we have in 8, and I think that improves quality of life. So I know that's a long answer, but those are just some of the examples of not just place, but people as well. Thank you so much, Mayor. We also have a question along those same lines about the grocery stores. And the question is, can you develop the old Winn-Dixie store into a sit-down restaurant with a sports bar, grill, or anything? Yeah. So... The truth is, I wouldn't mind that. I'm open to anything. I would love to have Chuck E. Cheese at the old showbiz, what y'all call it, showbiz growing up. Look, a couple things here. The building is owned by somebody in the private sector. The city of Birmingham does not own the building. 
However, uh, Mr. Cornell Wesley, who leads our IEO Economic Development Department, will tell you that it's probably our responsibility to better market this area and let people know these things exist, and then put them with that person that owns it and see what can be negotiated and come up with. Now, the power we do have is across the street at the Crossplex. Uh, we're under a non-disclosure agreement right now, so I can't give names, but we're working hard uh, to get a developer and in, in place of Mr. Nesbitt and his organization not being there no more. Um, but our priority of all the things in order is grocery store in District 8. Second would be some form of entertainment slash restaurants, et cetera. We'll continue to work hard at it. Thank you so much, Mayor. So we're going to go back to something that you mentioned earlier, and it was in reference to the critical repair application process. And we do have Chris Hatcher standing by. Oh, can let him have it. That. Yes, Give it to him. Good evening, Mr. Mayor. My name is Chris Hatcher. I serve as the interim director of the Community Development Department for the City of Birmingham. And in answering that question, uh, unfortunately, yes. Uh, you will have to reapply for the critical repair program on that uh, uh, application of that year of application period. The reason why is that this is a federally funded program and it's based off of income. We need to update changes in your income on an annual basis in order so we can assess your eligibility for the program. So therefore, we do require that you reapply each year. So unfortunately, if you weren't selected in the previous year, please come back down and reapply again and provide us with your updated documentation. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hatcher. Thank you so much, sir. And we want to remind everyone, if you do have a question, you can send your question to townhall at birminghamal.gov. And if you missed any of those numbers that were mentioned earlier to report illegal dumping, please call 311 or call 254-6344. Our next question is, what can be done about the tractors and trailers that are illegally parked in parking lots? Mr. Yates, you want to take that? Or Captain Dole, you want to take that? Either one or both of y'all doesn't matter. As far as the parking lots are concerned, it being private property, we would have to have the owners to assist in the enforcement of that. Um, so we would um, try to contact the realty, the realty owner, the, the property owners, Sometimes we can get letters or permission from them and we can actually enforce enforce ordinances and violations on their property. And we've done that in Five Points West. I think we have one of the, um, one of the realtor owners that we have a letter on file that gives us permission to do that. Um, I don't know specifically the location that they're speaking of, but if we can get that, we can, we can see what we can do about it. Gotcha. We'll address it. Thank you, Cap. So just encourage them that they have addresses to email or text them or call them into us so we can get that information to captain. Yes, sir. And everyone, please send that to townhall at birminghamal.gov and we will be glad to get you an answer for that or get it taken care of. The next one is a DPW question and it is what can be done about clearing the alleys so that our DPW trucks can actually get through them? As you, Mr. Yates. Uh, I'm not, uh, I'm Josh Yates, serve as Deputy Director of the Department of Public Works. Um, I'm not very clear on the question about what clearing the alleys. Um, we, we do, uh, if it's in regard to vegetation, we do clear the vegetation back in order to get our uh, trucks down there. Uh, a lot of alleys uh, need to, it needs to be very clear that the city only has roughly 15 feet or less in the alleys. So if you think about that, the amount of pavement that's there, it's less than two to three feet on each side of that pavement. So the city has very little property that that actually expands beyond the pavement there. So the uh, can easily get through. The city only has a small amount of property. We do work work the alleys very very often. Uh, with our trucks uh, and with Miss Miss Danita Ryan and her horticulture crews, 
Uh, we, we pick up litter in the alleys and we also pick up and service garbage in the alleys. So uh, we do get our trucks through there and we're able to serve them. I, I, I hope I answered that question correctly. I, I, if I understood that. It looks like somebody defending you. They're mad because one of their neighbors is keeping you out from going to the alley very <laughs> at ease. Yes, sir. Yeah, thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you so much, Mayor. And we also want to remind everyone if they do have some things that they need to take to the landfill, you can call the Eastern Area Landfill at 205-655-3391. And we actually have a box that is located at 1044 Avenue West in Inslee that citizens and, and neighbors and anyone can take trash to at any point in time. The next question is along the lines of code enforcement, and it basically says, how are we doing on code enforcement and with shots fired? Looks that that question may be two different people. On the second end of that question, I would get, I would say, Captain, whatever you want to say to that. Um, and on code enforcement, that's so broad. So, you know, I'll try to take a stab at that cap. Feel free to add if if you're speaking to again, let's say inoperable vehicles or parking on the lawn. Um, people have been complaining about West Precinct because they've been enforcing it lately. So um, I think that's going better. And I think housing code, as you see, uh, those numbers from earlier in, in your packet, um, those numbers are pretty steady too. And so we are enforcing that from that standpoint. Cap, did you want to add or share anything about shots fired in District 8 or, yeah, or West Precinct? Um, as far as shots fired, we do have shot spotter locations. Um, some are in District 8. Officers respond immediately. It goes directly to dispatch and we respond to any shot spotter calls. Other than that, if we receive calls from citizens who are concerned about shots being fired, we respond. But our biggest thing that we've had that's happened in the last year, we have a discharging task force. So the discharging task force responsibility is to respond to calls where shots have been fired. They fought, they handle the investigation. The officers do the report. They initiate an investigation to make a determination of who's doing the shooting. And actually we made quite a few arrests just using that investigative tool and that, that unit. Thank you, Cap. And I'll just simply add this. Just since January 1, so the completion of one quarter in 2021, Chief shared with me this morning that Birmingham Police Department citywide has already, in three months of this year, taken well over 700 gun, illegal guns off the street. Y'all, we take them off and they get, they get them so easily. Like, it's, it's I, I don't, it's hard. And I mean, and in America, that's a gun culture. We try to do everything we can, taking illegal guns off the street, but they just get them back that easy. I mean, when you think about that, 700 guns, 700 plus guns in three months is a lot of guns. So. Thank you so much, Mayor. We also want to thank everyone who's watching on Facebook Live and to let you know that we are getting your questions. And this one um, is around uh, some facets of DPW and we can have Ms. Ryan, if you're available, to also talk about DPW in relation to code enforcement and to tackle the second part of that, which is, who do I speak to about growing a community garden? Ms. Ryan? Uh, yes, I'm Danita Ryan with uh, a deputy director with Public Works also, and to grow a community garden, you can also reach us at 781-6210, the Horticultural Department. Uh, they can give you any advice that you need on growing a vegetable garden and also can literally uh, donate some plants as well. Um, what was the other part of that? Hold enforcement. Sir? Hold enforcement. Uh, what was it? Oh, the question, I'm sorry, the question is about code enforcement. Oh. Anything about code enforcement you want to add? Uh, sports code enforcement, uh, anything that has been uh, illegal dump or forced housing, 
Uh, also, overgrown property, you can always reach out to code enforcement. They will always come out and investigate uh, whatever your complaint is as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Ryan. And also that number that she gave, 781-6210. And we have teams in horticulture who will be happy to speak with you. This one, Mayor, is a, an excellent question. It says, as neighborhood leaders, how can we better connect with our residents since we still cannot meet in person? And also, is there an email list available? Is Alice here? Yes, sir. So as Ms. Alice Williams comes in, everybody, she's the, uh, one of our deputy directors of community development. I'll start. As I told you earlier, we're probably, I feel like we're in the fourth quarter of the coronavirus. As you see in this room, um, we got measures in place as far as facial covers. And so, you know, there are a lot of different things neighborhood officers can do around how to still stay in contact with their residents, which is the question, how do they stay in contact? Good evening, I'm Alice Williams and I serve as Deputy Director of Community Resources. Um, we recommend that, um, first of all, we reach out by phone calls to our neighborhoods, our friends and our families. We also do Zoom, we do WebEx, we do Facebook. And we also reach out through our Office of Community Resource Services. So if there's anything that you want us to get out to the neighbors and residents, we post those on our sites. And we just ask that you reach out to the one right next door to you. That's our best way to communicate right now. The second part of the question, I believe, is there email lists or email addresses? Yes, what we ask people to do is reach out to your community resource service representative, and we like to get those messages out to the public. We have a lot of people from different agencies that reach out to us, so we'll post it on our Facebook page, on the community resource page, and we send it out through our office and through the mayor's office um, with Ms. Silva Scarborough. She reaches out as well, so we have communication means that way. Thank you. All right, you're welcome. Well, just to clarify, all neighborhood up presidents, y'all received the emails Ms. Silva sends? All right. So when they get your emails. That's good, Mayor, because a lot of hard work goes into that. We put our heart in this stuff that we stand. So yes, Mr. McCall responds quite often. And uh, yes, thank you, neighborhood officers. So the next question of the evening is, what ways can we help each other when crime incidents happen in Inslee Highlands? And there's a second part of that that also says, how can we improve the engagement between officers and our neighborhoods? So that's a public safety question, Mayor. Yeah. I'm trying to see if I can read that. Um, at the first part of the question is about um, crime in Inslee Highlands. What can we do to improve it? I'm mm -hmm. sorry. How can we help each other? Actually, how can we help each other? Yes, I'll read that again. What ways can we help each other when crime incidents happen in Inslee Highlands? That's the first question. Oh, Captain. Okay, very good question. Very good question. Um, one way is to, if you see something, say something. Keep your eyes and ears open. I. Um, I have, we have a task force at West Precinct. And what their focus is, is whatever complaints I receive. Daily I receive complaints, I send them to, the, to that area to address those complaints. So, believe it or not, many of our narcotics complaints come from, come from citizens. Officers are riding, they'll stop cars, they take guns, they take um, drugs, but most of our citizens give us the biggest um, complaints, the most complaints. So the best thing to do is say something. We have in West Precinct in District 8, I think about eight, at least eight um, search warrants have been conducted in that area. Most of those came from citizens' complaints that we followed up on. So that's the best thing to do, um, to be our eyes and ears because most, criminal, most criminals won't do criminal acts in front of us. So. Um, the second part is. Thank you so much, Captain. That second part is how can we improve the engagement between officers and our neighborhoods? In the time of COVID, that's a difficult question. Um, outside of COVID, we started, we implemented coffee with a cop, coffee with a captain, which I would really enjoy at this time just to get to know everybody. 
So we are doing some, there are some Zoom meetings I know that Ms. Watkins is doing with the neighborhood, um, the neighborhood presidents, and we can continue that. I'll try to engage and be on more of those. But um, outside of COVID, as soon as we get a little more open and uh, this disease behind us, we'll develop some some more things that are community oriented. Yeah, and just to add to what Cap said, I would repeat what I said earlier. Through the I, and I'll just challenge the neighborhood president through Miss Felicia, y'all. I would I would you get them block captain going. They're responsible for literally looking out for the block during a certain their time period, and they help you run the play. And literally between you all, that block captain and captain and her team, I believe y'all can suppress whatever y'all want. I mean that. I'm not just saying that. Thank you so much, Mayor. And the next one has a couple of items in it, and it was something that was addressed earlier in the PowerPoint, but it basically says, can we have code enforcement address the following? Parking on lawns, parking on city right-of-ways, removing peddlers from selling goods along the commercial corridor, and so forth. So I think I can take this one. Yes. The first point, um, A and B, parking on lawns and parking on city right-of-way. Again, we've started enforcing that, and a lot of people are being agitated when they come out. The car has been sitting there for three years. Nobody's paid attention to it, and all of a sudden they see a tick. They see something, a sticker on it. I actually got a call from a citizen who literally says, "This car is in my. This car has been here these many years. Why are you all want to do something about it now?" And I said, "It's easy. Citizens have told us, please enforce, please enforce. So that's what we're doing. So let us know if you need some help with the car, um, or it'll be told, or something else. You'll be brought to court." I think the other parts of the question, if somebody can help me, oh. About the abandoned vehicles. Peddlers. The biggest two things we got right now, everybody, is these car washes that keep popping up and food trucks. Now, let me speak to the food trucks. There's already an ordinance that exists about regulation of food trucks. I'm actually pro food truck, but I think in certain spaces where they are, how it's conducted, et cetera, you need safety measures, right? But the other, the biggest form of peddling that we've seen lately, man, y'all, the, the, if you just have a car wash and you don't have a, a business license or something like that, runoff water, trash, et cetera, et cetera, there are a lot of different forms of peddlers. But the reason I'm bringing this one to your attention is because people keep bringing it to ours. So what we're doing to enforce now is um, the combination of um, our business license team with BPD to go out and investigate and cite and or give warnings about you have to come into compliance. If you don't, we're ready to prepare to shut you down. Ms. Sybil? Yes, sir, Mayor, and thank you for that answer. The next question, what efforts are being planned to revitalize our neighborhoods and communities in Five Points West in preparation for the World Games and beyond? All right, go ahead. Sounds like a Ms. Dora Sims question. <laughs> hey, Ms. <Ms>. Sims. <laughs> uh, and you know, Dora Sims don't play, Mr. Mayor. So, <laughs> good good evening, Kelvin Datcher. I serve as the director of external affairs, government affairs for the city of Birmingham. So, the, the World Games is an extraordinary opportunity for Birmingham to showcase its growth over the last several years to the entire world. Um, just recently, they signed an agreement, a national broadcasting agreement for a certain number of hours. There's also a global broadcasting agreement. So people will be able to see Birmingham in a way that they can only imagine the, the growth that we've had. So the, the mayor has already authorized and directed us to do several things. That is to make sure one, that the um, venues in our communities are showcased. Chief among those are the Crossplex and Legion Field. They will be home to major events during the World Games to attract folks into those communities and to showcase who we are uh, as a city. But more importantly, the mayor has also said that this is an opportunity for us to invest in our community. How do we invest into, into black owned businesses, particularly around, around, along the Third Avenue corridor? We will be working directly with those folks through facade grants and other opportunities to invest in their, in their businesses, to make them shine, make them beautiful, to give them the kind of 
infrastructure also so that they can succeed. Because someone may be great at frying chicken, but they may not be great at balancing their books. So how do we make sure that that business that sells great chicken also has a tight financial operation in the, on the back end? The mayor has authorized that to happen. Um, the mayor worked very closely with Congresswoman Terry Sewell on the American Rescue Plan. The city will be receiving over two years, $148 million, $820,000. The mayor has also already directed those dollars to be invested into our nine and neighborhoods. Chief among those are the places that will be showcased during the World Games. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much, Mayor and Mr. Kelvin Datcher. Our next question, can code enforcement enforce the cutting of lawns regularly and board up homes if they are vacant and the question is being asked for safety purposes and hopefully for reduction and potential crime well let Ms. ryan take that question thank you so much sir um as the mayor has said uh you know when it comes to cutting lots vacant lots and so forth uh, it's something that uh actually it's more grass out there than it is us. But code enforcement can go out and write up the property, uh, do weed abatement on it and process it out, uh, take the, the owners to court. But in the process of time, um, we also like to go in and as it have been written up, we go in and we will cut the property ourselves. But code enforcement can always go out to handle a problem. When there's a problem, overgrown, vacant lots, abandoned buildings, that if you reach out to code enforcement, they will come out and they will inspect it, write it up, and then they will process it through the courts. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mayor and Ms. Ryan. And someone would like to have an update on the Bellevue Heights Gateway Project from Fairfield. Yes, yeah, Mr. Um... Mr. Gunn, I told you I was going to get you an answer to that too. Is is either one of our team members here, Mr. Ravel or Ms. Bell? Oh, hey, brother Witt, can you hear us? I can. You got any update on the um, the Gateway project related to Bellevue Heights? I got. I told Mr. Gunn I was going to get him an answer. Well, Mr. Gunn, uh, how you doing, sir? First of all, hello, Mr. Mayor. Uh, let me get my video on. Hello, Mr. Mayor. Uh, what I want to do is this, Mr. Gunn. I'd like to uh, take a deep dive into that right away for you. I, I think that is the ongoing process with Denise Bell as well as El Ravel. But I'd like to give you my number personally so I can give you the satisfaction that you deserve. My number is 254 2224. And I certainly was not sparing the effort in giving you all the information that you need about that. I think that is ongoing. I'd like to give you solid information about that. So give me a call, stand ready, and hopefully you'll give me your number so I can call you if you don't call me. Okay? I'll get it to you. I'll get it to you, Mr. Witt. Okay. Mr. Gunn, I got some good news. Um, in conjunction to what Mr. Witt has said, which he will follow up with you, I actually did receive an email. I should have just pulled it up, um, but it's fresh. It says, uh, for your knowledge, we ran into a slight roadblock roadblock surrounding the offer process used for many years. Um, legal is now reviewing and advising, so I think one of the properties that we are not in control of is wrapped up. However, there's some additional information in here. Could you please share with Mr. Gunn that we're wrapping up closing process? Funds are in place and staff is reviewing the bid package while we wrap up the closing process. Unfortunately, right now we don't have an estimated time frame because we still have that roadblock related to um, the offer process for one of the properties. Um, but we're pushing to start either late summer or early fall. Um, it's definitely in the capital projects queue. And so I just read you word for word the message I received. Is that satisfactory, sir? Or is that a satisfactory, satisfactory answer? <clears throat> We'll get you, we'll get you with Mr. Witt and we'll keep some information coming to you. Mayor, we also have Mike Eddington on the line with PEP who can address some more about that issue. Mike, can you hear us? Good afternoon. Um, this is Mike Eddington. I serve as city engineer. Uh, 
when I uh, put in the message box that I could answer that, I think the mayor covered that we are just uh, very close to wrapping up the right of way um, acquisition, for this, including temporary access easements. And we'll be bidding this out in the coming months. Thank you, Mike. Told y'all. Tell Mike, Mike, do not cut your hair, sir. <laughs> Thank you. It. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. It's always good when we can get real time answers. So we appreciate that, PEP. Next question, and we have a lot that are coming in from Facebook. Is blue top on top of homes illegal? Mayor? It's a good question. I'm tell you, I tell you, I don't know. Y'all know I'm gonna keep it real with y'all. I, I don't know if it's illegal. Here's what I do know. Um, if I use the most recent example, what happened a few weeks back, unfortunately, in the Roebuck Springs, South Roebuck, and South East Lake area, there were a minimum of 120, 130 homes damaged. And if you go there right now, many of them have blue tarps. The question I, I imagine is, how long can they be on your roof, right? I don't know the answer to that. And if it reaches a certain point, is that illegal? Again, I don't know the answer to that. But whoever asked that question from Facebook, if you want to send us some additional information as far as who you are and or an email address or a number, let us walk down an honest, g genuine answer for you um, and find out. And so um, I'm saying all those words and I don't know the answer. Good enough, Mayor. And to the person who did ask that question, why don't you reach out to us at townhall at birminghamal.gov and we will work very hard to get an answer to you as soon as possible. So the next question, recycling, recycling, recycling. And someone on Facebook would like to know, why aren't recyclable materials being picked up? Mr. Yates, you may sir. To answer your question on recycling, um, recycling is being picked up, it's being picked up across the city. Uh, normally across the city, it's uh, picked up every once a month. Uh, in our pilot program area, it is being picked up every week. However, um, recycling misses do happen. Uh, that, that, that's part of the, the job we're in. We try to minimize that. Uh, we service, uh, have over 10 million services throughout the entire year. Uh, and, and, and DPW for servicing for residential garbage pickup and for, for uh, also with uh, recycling and brush pickup. And if we're running at 99.9% .9 efficiency, that's still over 10,000 misses. So I, I, I want to commend our, our, our crews on doing a good job there, but we also strive to do better. So if we missed you, please let us know. We're gonna try and try and get out to you as fast as possible. If I have to just send a pickup truck out there to grab the recyclables that are left behind, that's what we'll do. Um, our recycle numbers are uh, looking pretty good, but if we missed you, we're gonna come back and try and get it and take care of it. So Thank please, you. Please, please report it through 311. Thank you, Mr. H. Thank you so much, Mayor. And we also want to remind everyone, and we mentioned this earlier, even if recycling is missed or if trash and brush is missed or household garbage, the mayor ensures that we get the message out to neighborhood officers every single day. We send a report to them every single day in reference to trash and brush and COVID vaccines or where they can text for more information. And so he ensures that this is what we do to keep everyone up to date with update, updates such as that from our departments like public work. So yes, call 311, but we want everybody to know that information is sent to every single neighborhood officer in all 99 neighborhoods and 23 communities every single day and some Saturdays. So we're trying to communicate as much as possible. But if there's something that is missed, either call 311. And again, if you have another question, you can email it to townhall at birminghamal.gov. Our next question for the evening, does funding exist for repaving the alleyways with black asphalt in District 8? Mr. Fowler, I don't know the answer to that. Thank <laughs> you. 
Uh, that's a, a great question, actually. Um, my name is James Fowler. I serve as the director of the Birmingham Department of Transportation. And where we've started with all of the deferred maintenance um, that we have and all of our infrastructure. So is, is first trying to make sure that we're making a consistent year over year significant investment in resurfacing of the main roadways. Uh, but we recognize that a lot of those alleys are in really tough shape. And um, I know I've got one behind my house. And so um, as we continue to make investments in the resurfacing of the main roadways, our plan is to uh, expand that into the alleys because I know that that's a critical need. Um, hopefully, as we're looking at potential funding in an infrastructure build, that'll uh, move us faster along in that process. Uh, but our first starting point is investing in the main roadways. And so um, alleys are definitely on our radar. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much, Mayor. And we also want to give out a couple of those numbers again, in case you're just joining us. We mentioned earlier about the Jefferson County Vaccine Call Center. You can call 205-858-2221 or to register for your vaccine, your COVID-19 vaccine, call 975-1881. And just in case you mentioned when we were discussing earlier about drug nuisance properties, you can call 254 2 Three six nine, and someone with the mayor's office will be happy to assist you. The next question that has come in, it says, will the city contact business owners of property across from Enterprise Rental Car in Inns on Inslee Avenue to work out details of parking their 18 wheelers off the area in the I-59 Inslee exit? The answer is yes. That's the short, shortest answer you'll get tonight. Will and I'll make a, a, a a personal visit. Would that be you and Kelvin Datcher, sir? Yeah, we're pulling up. Yes, sir. Thank you so much, Mayor, and thank you so much, uh, Mr. Datcher. Um, revitalization uh, question is, can we have DPW do biannual cleanings of our alleys and in our neighborhoods? Ms. Ryan? Oh, yeah, doesn't okay. matter. Um, thank you. That's that's another good question. In cleaning of the alleys, um, biannually cleaning, we probably do service your alleys twice a year at least. Our crews are out there every day. Um, I have emails in my inbox right now that that consist of several miles, hundreds of bags of litter picked up on a daily basis by our crews. Our crews are out there in every district and every uh, area of town picking up litter. Uh, they bag it, they take photos of it, and the very next week, it's almost like they weren't even there. Uh, it, the mayor mentioned this earlier, but uh, we have to do a better job uh, ourselves just just not littering, uh, or, or, or those that are doing it. Probably nobody on this call, call litters. Uh, but uh, the fact of the matter is that we do go out, we clean it, we pick it up, and it's back out there. And I can show photo after photo of, of, of how good it looks when they're done, and a week later, we're, we're back out there again. So. Um, Yes, that is a possibility. Thank you. Y'all help us get those. Um, Mr. Presidents, Madam Presidents, and Mr. Presidents, help us get these block captains so we can catch some folks. Please. Oh, we're going to chop it up as soon as it's over, Mr. President. I got you, sir. Okay. <laughs> Mr. McCall, if you are finished, you good, sir? I got you, Mr. McCall. Okay. The mayor's got you, Mr. McCall, and I'm I'm going to get to this one, and we'll make plenty of time for you. We're just so glad to have you here tonight, sir. So this one says, "We are tired of the we buy houses for cash signs and other signs like that in our neighborhood." A person who sent the question is says it is tacky and wants to know what can be done about it. So two things. I'll take this one. And again, I'll be very brief with my answer. One, DPW can take them down. I guarantee you they'll be back up next week. Two, uh, it got so bad at an area over on the eastern side of town between Rugby Ave and Porto Madrid. <laughs> I picked up the phone and dialed a number that time and told the person who I was, and if they didn't stop, we would have to take another course. I didn't get any more complaints about that particular sign, so maybe I should start making more phone calls. Ms. Scarborough? I think that's a good answer, Mayor. Next question. 
And it basically it begins with a statement that says crime is a great concern in Inslee Highlands and that they are hurt by all of the events that are going on. And the person that sent this in just would like to know from a start who the neighborhood beat officers are and how can they find that information out? Yeah, I'll let you take the actual question, but to the statement of crime being a great concern, we agree. Um, the truth is, I'm not sure y'all, to be honest, it's not designed for us to put an officer on every corner or to put a camera on every corner. And it's definitely not designed for us to put a police officer in every home and or in every vehicle when there's something going on. What we do wanna do is have more presence. What we do wanna do is engage more on foot patrol. What we do wanna do is create these these block watch programs so we can get some additional eyes and ears out here and build relationships and build trust so people come forth with more information. I believe there's a direct correlation between our ability to solve crime and decrease crime. And we solve it by citizens not only coming forward, but going through the entire process, not just talking to the police, but if it's a, a dire enough talking to the DA. And not just talking to the DA, but if it goes to trial, talking in front of a jury, that's usually a long process. And so the more we have residents involved, we believe we can decrease crime. Um, around who the actual um, beat officers are for Inslee Highlands, I will leave that answer to Kat. Thank you, Mayor. So I get that question a lot. and. Um, my short answer is there is a collective effort in the Birmingham Police Department to patrol Inslee and all of the beats in West Precinct. That being said, officers, a lot of citizens will like to get a hand on hand relationship with their B officer. It is difficult to do that um, in the sense that they're continuously patrolling, but we have several different entities that are working in that area, crime suppression, um, our task force units, um, citywide traffic task force, and their focus is to go to an area where we, where we have an issue and address that issue immediately. If we get, we'll get to a, t a point in time where officers will be able to stop by, um, like I said, coffee with a cop, when we do that, you'll definitely be able to be, meet your beat officer because he'll be at that event. Um, we'll have that in each neighborhood with the neighborhood presidents, anyone else who wants to attend. But um, right now, collectively, we're all patrolling your beats. Thank you, Kat. Mayor, the next question, and this one begins with a statement as well, and it says, roadblocks are a major concern. Do you think they are disproportionately impacting black communities, sir? I want to be clear about the first statement first, or sentence. City of Birmingham does not do roadblocks. We do checkpoints, and I want the community to know there is a distinction between a checkpoint um, and roadblocks. So we're not engaging roadblocks. I don't support roadblocks. Do you think they disproportionately impact black communities? Well, if you're referring to the checkpoints, the answer is no. The city of Birmingham is made up of 99 neighborhoods. Everybody should know 88 out of 99 are all black. And so that's literally the majority of the city is all black. But you should know in the other 11 neighborhoods that there are checkpoints as well. How do I know that? I have been in one in a white neighborhood. And so the checkpoints um, are spread out through our city. It's not one particular area. It's not one particular neighborhood. Um, and it is definitely not focused only in a black area when 88 out of 99 neighborhoods are all black and the other 11 neighborhoods receive the same amount of attention related to making sure our streets are safe. Good answer, Mayor. Thank you. And this one again is for Captain Doyle. And in mentioning coffee with a cop, someone would like to know when will coffee with a cop begin again?
I wish I could give a specific date and time. Um, right now, like I said, our major concern is COVID. Um, I know restaurants are open, but still there's social distancing in their restaurants. So as soon as we get a, an all clear, that it's okay for us to um, co-mingle, we'll, we will get it started. I'm ready to put, it's actually on my calendar now, but each month I strike it out. <laughs> not yet, not yet, <laughs> not yet. But um, I, I assure you it will happen. I look forward to it. Gotcha. Ms. Sybil, before we close out and I get some time with these neighborhood presidents, um, everybody, I want you to know we have a new director of IEO Economic Development. His name is Cornell Wesley. Um, he is a gift of the city. He is a son of the city. And there haven't been a lot of conversations or questions around economic development, particularly as it relates to the western side of town in District 8. But at a minimum, I would like to give him the floor to share anything he would like around this topic. Anything you want. Well, I think that's the basic. I'll get you to come up here. I'm certain uh, a lot of people are curious about what our preparations are around the world games in that specific corridor. I can tell you that our department has convened or rather commissioned a corridor 11 study. That study looks at a six mile track of what we know as Bessemer Superhighway Corridor 11, and not just looking at the aesthetic, not just looking at how it looks, but also the infrastructure needs that are needed for, for long-term um, growth. So we're talking fiber, we're talking not just lighting, we're talking the water sewer going from six inch to eight inch, and, and the appropriate things that these businesses who occupy Corridor 11 need for their own expansion. And so again, as we're pre preparing for the World Games, this study is for not just a study or research, it is for something to be in fact implemented. We're working across all departments within the city. This is not just an a, a economic development effort, it is a city effort that we hope will be able to promote and, and encourage transformation for that corridor. And one more thing, brother. Well, I talked to these five neighborhood officers who were present of the other five who are not here, and especially this young lady over here, Ms. Sims, uh, who's over the business district for the Angeli area. If I took away everything they talked about as far as a want, need, desires, grocery stores, I have shared the challenges, um, but you are new to the team with fresh eyes on this topic. Anything you want to leave them related to our effort? Absolutely. I can tell you that our goals are the same. We too want a grocery store in your in your in your neighborhood. Uh, we're we're moving aggressively and and with a partnership with Mastercard, we're now able to track the spending habits of people who originate from that zip code and build a case to these grocery providers of where the dollars really are. So now we actually have the data points to, to illustrate the demand that exists in your neighborhood. So now when we go and have these, these conversations with the Kroger's and the Audis of the world, we have an informed why, a why you should be in this city and why you should be in this corridor. So we are going to be aggressive, we're going to be intentional, and now we are informed with why they should, and we're going to make sure we transform and, and translate that information appropriately. Thank you, brother. Look, y'all want him to get a benediction too? <laughs> I was just playing, brother. Thank you so much, Mr. Wesley, and welcome, welcome, welcome. Just a few things before we end tonight. We want to thank everyone who did submit their questions. We are still ready and we are here to answer them. If you would have like to have one answer, you can send it to town hall at birminghamal.gov. And also, if you would like to see tonight's PowerPoint, you can visit www.birminghamal.gov slash town halls. And with that, Mayor, we will yeah. turn it back over to you. Well, I think it's the first time I'll actually look the camera um, to, um, square and say uh, to the citizens of District 8, thank you all for being with us tonight. Uh, thank you to the people behind the scenes who you all can't see, but I call them the engineers, the tech people who have made this um, event tonight, this town hall successful. Thank you so much. And to the department heads, um, to CAP, to all the team, deputy department heads, thank you all for everything. And then to you all, um, the, the neighborhood president, 
I picked up the phone, I called all of y'all, and you could have said yes or no, but you said yes, I'm grateful. You definitely could have said no to running again, so y'all may be on the crazy side like me. But I am extremely grateful to each of you um, because you don't get paid for what you do. You do it. I listened to each one of you, so I kind of got the, not the exact years, but I think I got 77, I got 30 plus, and I can go on and on how many years you've been living where you live and you love your neighborhood and you do everything you can. I just hope that here's what people always encourage me. This is what they say. Mayor, you can't do it alone. They say that all the time. I know you said, Ms. Vicky, all the time. Well, I want to say the same thing to you all. You can't do it alone. And by the way, it requires more than your vice president and your secretary. The three of you all can't do it alone. However we can be of assistance, don't hesitate to call us, text us, email us, come pop in, see us, whatever it is. It doesn't have to be when the world or the kitchen's on fire. If you got some ideas, throw them at us and we can get it done. If they can work, we'll do it. So just know from here, I'm grateful. Thanks for being with us tonight. And everybody at home, have a good night and be safe.